Well, good evening everybody. To those that I know, it's great to see you, those that I don't know, it's great to meet for the first time. My name's Bruce, I've uh, been a part of this church for over 10 years. I've been on staff um, for quite a while and now I'm a student up in um, Aberdeen and Luke kindly asked me to come down and kind of share on this topic called God for the Marginalised. But before we get going, it would be helpful, I suppose, to give some context of what we mean by marginalised. So, these are two definitions of who the marginalised is. It's good to understand what we're talking about tonight. The Oxford Dic Dictionary said a person or a group of people treated as insignificant or insignificant or peripheral. It's just the people that we don't think are worthy or have got any value to offer or just kind of on edge. You wouldn't have thought we're doing a PhD, we have wrote that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> that takes some doing, I tell you, that's why I'm there. But then there's an Hebrew understanding of it, which says that actually the marginalised are people who have been excluded socially. They don't belong in what our norms are. And often when they talk about in the Hebrew, there's this wonderful term, which I think is really helpful. It's not wonderful in the terms that it's, it's good, but it's wonderful for us to think about that, that actually the, the uh, marginalised are often those that are invisible in our community. Now that's going to play out later on when we think about that. So if we think about that now, it's group of group people that are not important, insignificant, on the edges, they're not in the main fold, we've excluded them, or they're invisible. What I want you to do now, was I sort out my notes, because they messed them up. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the tables, kind of talk about what kind of people do you think fits in those terms, in those brackets? And there's going to be two ways that you're going to look at this. One is, who do you think of is in the Bible? that speaks of these sorts of people. In the Bible, when we think of those, who do you think God speaks of when he speaks of the marginalised? But then bring it up to today as well. Think about who would we say are the marginalised now today in our community or in our society? Would there be differences? Is there new people we need to add to that? So if we take five minutes to sort of kind of think about that, and then, if a couple of people are going to be brave, come up and share that with us, them lists. Um, I was thinking about not biblical, there's a lot of biblical we're thinking of, the widows and orphans, those who are perceived of ceremony and clean, they were being definitely marginalised, like the lepers, the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, um, homeless people, disabled people, and those without jobs. And today we're very similar lists. We don't we haven't got the unclean people. Them asylum seekers as people see them in the world. Not that I do. Uh, we see disabled people again, <coughs> homeless, but sometimes they're marginalized, homeless because they'll be marginalized, or marginalized because they're homeless. There could be overlap. Um, people with mental health problems, mm -hmm. and plenty more. That's what we came up with. Perfect, thank you. Um, we were at a Samaritan, well, for the biblical part, wrote Samaritans, lepers, tax collectors, prostitutes, um, widows or orphans, demon-possessed people, the barren women and shepherds, and then for today, um, drug addicts or in general any addiction, homeless people, uh, people in modern slavery, refugees and prostitutes. Does anybody else want to go? Thanks for that. That were I've just checked the actual slides are back and they're not wrong with them back there. So I don't know what it is when it comes up this way. So hopefully we'll bear with us, but it looks okay. But the um if we have the next slide up, I've just kind of put some down, but they're not exhaustive, and I thought some of them that, that, that were really helpful. But we have those at the top, 
that's the, the normals, like the widow and the orphan and sinner. And I put exiles. That the, the Bible uses that term exile to people who are not in the country of, of their origin. And that could be up for different, we have different titles for that now, but that's definitely one. But for today, I've put, I've put all of them down, but I think there's one that I want to pick up on there that actually it's funny that Luke shared that about shame. Often the marginalised today are those that have been affected by crime or have done certain crimes. And shame is a paralyzer and it keeps you in the shadows. And the shame around education, the shame around social status. I think shame is a really, really big part that plays into the marginalized today. I think we're in a more honor and shame culture than probably what back then. Because there's, for me, there's more um, measuring sticks or yardsticks that we can measure by success and shame. And I think that's a really big one to do. Right. So now we know what we're going to talk about tonight, right? Is God for those guys. But I would also put out there, right, is that one of the extreme marginalised in the um, um, biblical and today is the sinner. And are we not glad that God's got a heart for the sinner? Because we won't be sire otherwise. So that's a good start. So that's what we're going to look at. So now I can kind of give a bit of introduction and some context then of what that looks like. And so there's a danger for me tonight. One of them is that we've got Bruce to talk about this because this is what Bruce really cares about. This is Bruce's thing. For those who don't know, I was were, I were born just up the road uh, in Ollerton. It's a single parent family. We were extremely poor. Uh, we had a saying where I lived. We used to always say this, we're so poor, we can't even pay attention. That's how broke we were. And then we could grow up. We could, and it was. So you, we, I felt marginalised as a kid growing up. Extremely poor. We had to get his clothes from, um, free from council and uh, all of this. And then education with that, then... I fell into addiction, fell into homelessness, so continuously adding to this marginalised um, um, title that I got. Grace, gracefully, the Lord saved me and brought me out of that, and I started coming to this church. <clears throat> and then I started working in the ministry that reached out to the addict and to the homeless and to kind of the marginalised and broke, and it seemed like the natural fit, because I were an expert on it, so to say. And from there... I continued to do that, and I had a real heart for the poor and lost. And then I did my pastor in training role here with the special eye of caring for that. So there's a danger is, this is just Bruce's thing. So this is what his course is going to talk about. This is his thing. But one of my hopes for tonight is to show that, no, it's not my thing. That this is God's thing. That I think... God's calling us as an invitation to participate in this life. Somebody once said to, said to me, you're probably the best person to be working with the addict because you've got so much experience. I'm like, being an addict is not on your CV for a qualification of being good at a job. That's not what it is. But my heart for going out there and for trying that is because of my conviction that when I got saved and I read the Bible, I found a God that was for me. Yeah. It was for me when I was fatherless. It was for me when I was poor, ill-educated, victim of crime, the perpetrator of crime. And we'll see that's gonna be important later on coming on. That actually this is who God is for. And it was my conviction then that God's called us into a life to do that. I think Jesus speaks more into that than anything else. The other danger is we can see God for the marginalised or the marginalised is something like that's what them people do over there. They're good at that, but this is what we do. Or we'll have a certain ministry or a charity that'll just deal with that. Like it's an add-on to church life, or it's kind of an extra that we can adopt 
it was Christian life. And I want to kind of show tonight that I feel that, I get my conviction that this is a part of who God's character is. God's everyday life and ministry. It's not something he does because it makes him look good. It's not something he does because he thinks it's good. But it's very integral to actually who he is. And once that wonderful invitation comes into that then, to participate in that life, for me, is a joyous and good thing. The other danger is, though, is that everybody feels bad and thinks they're rubbish and we're not doing enough. And that's not what I aim to do tonight. I don't think that's what Jesse's aim was this morning. And he didn't make us do that. But actually, to see this not as an obligation or a demand, but an invitation. And that's what I aim to show. Because this is my conviction, is that I think... So I've gone away to study, and this is a part of my study, actually, that's come into it, is this idea of... <clears throat> the spiritual work and the earthly work. That, what's my point, is getting souls into heaven or caring for people? Like the two opposed things, I would argue that they're not. I think they belong together, they should be together, and they are together. I don't think it's either or, we care for people spiritually or physically. That we care for those that are marginalised and pushed on the edge. I think as a Christian, this is what I've wrote, and I mean, I hope this kind of makes sense, that I think as, as a believer, it means that we should know God. But to know God means we must know his heart. But to know his heart means we must experience it. And to experience God's heart is to participate in the life of God. And it's a God invitation to participate in his life in caring for those that are invisible or on the outside. I spoke with Jez earlier and we had a, a, a quick conversation and I says to him, I think what Jez laid out quite openly and bare this morning that he doesn't think you can split loving God and loving the neighbour. That these go together. And I said to him, I said, don't think that I am super heretical. But I said, listen to me, Adam Jez. I said, I believe that we are saved for participation, not for a destination. I don't think that we're saved here to end up somewhere. But I think we're saved now to participate in the life of God for eternity. And the destination comes with that. And it's my conviction then that this is what we're going to look to tonight. So we know what we're looking at. We know, mate, and my conviction. Are we all right so far? Do we agree with me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So when we say that God cares for something, or when we say we care for something, the word that we often use is compassion, right? This is the word that we use. So what is compassion? So the next thing that we're going to speak about is just talk about what do we think we mean by compassion? And have you got any examples of what compassion looks like? Have you seen somebody who's been really compassionate or think, oh, that's a real act of compassion? So again, we'll have a little discussion for five minutes of what we mean. It's important for us to go forward to really understand what terms we're using and we can apply them. So what is it? And have we seen really good practice in it? And then we'll do the same again. A few people come up and share. Um, I only mention it because it kind of happened to me today, um, interestingly. Uh, I would describe compassion as... Here it is. Hang on, I can read your notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> you see someone who is in need and you give them what they need because they're in need. You can't really have compassion on someone who already 
has what they would need. So if I fed my friend who's got loads of food in his fridge, it wouldn't be compassion, it'd be nice, um, <laughs> but it wouldn't be showing compassion. But if my friend was in need, or if a stranger was in need, there, there could be compassion. So this happened to me today on the walk over here um, because I decided not to take my wallet because I wasn't going to buy anything. And I forgot that and I went into Morrison's and I bought coffee. Um, <laughs> and I didn't have my wallet and I don't have Apple Pay on my phone. So I had to explain to the woman, she could tell that I was in need. I was like, oh, I, haven't got, I haven't got my money. Um, <laughs> I can come back tomorrow. I'll bring you, I'll bring you money. Um, and she said it was okay. She said, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So she had compassion. And that's a very small thing. You know, I'm not marginalised. I'm not particularly in need. And I'll take her the money tomorrow. But there was a compassion there from her. She doesn't know me. She doesn't know whether I'm going to come back tomorrow. But she showed compassion for the fact that I might. Stop that. Thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything? Yeah. Right, what did we have? What did we say compassion is? Somebody give me it in a sentence. Uh, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Good, I like it. Walking alongside somebody. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we can see this all of them. The, right. This is two, I know it's a bit small, but I'm going to go through it. So these are two definitions of compassion. The first one, again, is Oxford Dictionary. And it says sympathetic, Peter and concern for suffering, suffering or misfortunes of others. But evil compassion, which when you say that it's where half men, its root word means will. So think of what this compassion really looks like biblically. Think of when a woman is pregnant. <laughs> I've brought an example with me tonight. <laughs> that the connotations of what it denotes is this. That it's not mere sentiment, it's not mere feelings. Peter is not compassion. It's self-evident love. It should be seen and should be known. And people should be able to point and say that's what it is. It's sustaining love. It's love that's going to always going to keep giving to raise and help this unborn child. It's unconditional. There's no strings attached to it. It's a providing love. It's a love that's going to be providing unconditionally for this unborn baby. But then there's a real vulnerability in this. There's a vulnerability not only to the mother, but to the baby that's dependent on her. And the vulnerability stands in that if this mother at any time cuts that off, then there's going to be a problem. Now, isn't that a wonderful more conception of what uh, compassion really is? That it's something that when God says that he has compassion on the marginalised, the lost, the poor, what he's really saying is, is that, that his love's going to be self-evident for them that is going to care and wants to provide for them. That is not stood somewhere distant, looking down going, oh, I feel sorry for them. I wish they'd get their act together. They're not kind of good enough. No, biblical compassion or godly compassion is action with the heart to meet the needs and care for those that can't care for themselves. That brings them back in to the fold, brings them back in to the community. In that guy, I love that, mate. Maybe it's because I'm compassionate. More than <laughs> <laughs> so now, and I know time's getting on, I want to go through th three quick things. But I want to show the kind of character of God now. We've established what compassion is, we've established what marginalised is. We're going to look at um, three different areas. We're going to look at God's attributes. We're going to look at God's heart. Then we're going to look at God's location. Then his instruction to us. Then it's going to be where we can go from here. So the first one is God's attributes. So attributes are something that we pretend to self patience, kind, love, 
and these. So there's two verses that I've picked out here. One in Isaiah 30, 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is God of justice. Blessed who I wait for him. Isaiah 54. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Now my covenant and peace will be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. The first thing to notice that often when we speak of God's attributes, you get more than one at the same time. So you're getting gracious, compassion, justice, peace. Now the reason why God is compassionate is because he is just. The reason why he is just is because he's graceful. And God's attributes, I was trying to explain this earlier and I can't get this, they're different from ours. When I say Pastor Matthew's compassionate, my implication is it could be more compassionate or it could not be. But it's not the same when we're talking about God. It's not like God could be more compassionate. He's eternally always compassionate. His heart is always for the marginalised. He's always going to act in love and grace and peace towards those that are on the outside. You see, this is not something that he thinks is good to do to just do on a weekend, but actually, he's very core being. He cannot be anything else but loving the marginalised. God's heart. Now of these verses. Deuteronomy 10. He defends the cause of the fatherless, the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. God's heart is that he actually loves doing this. You want to know what God's like, what his heart's like? He said this, he loves to defend the cause of the fatherless. That he loves the foreigner, clothing them. And there's a lot of places where, in, uh, they've got, I've got a million scriptures, God says, actually, when they, when people come in to your land, like, extremely bless them, and I delight in that's what you're doing in blessing them. That God's heart and his attributes are of the same. Defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and oppressed. And what I want to do tonight is kind of mirror this, kind of with the New Testament as well, with Jesus, and see, because when we're talking in the Old Testament, it feels like we're talking about something kind of maybe out there, but we see in the Lord Jesus Christ that this stuff gets grounded. So if we think that compassion is not only the heart of God, but the action of God, where do we see Jesus in compassion or compassion in Jesus? Well, the next slide. Yes, yeah, compassion on the lost sleep sheep. That like he looks out, they've all not got a shepherd, and he has compassion on them. And he does something about that. They're hungry. He's just been ministering. And they're all there and they come, there's 5,000. And not only are they hungry, but they're sick as well. And his heart's compassion, he says, let's sit down, we're, we're going to feed. He has them because they've been following him for days. Now, it's not like they've been following him for days and then they're hungry. A lot of these would have been hungry, really are. God's heart, God, we see in Jesus, the manifestation of God's compassion. Of the sick, he looks out <coughs> at, at, at the blind blind man and he has he's deeply moved in compassion he doesn't have pity in that he feels sorry for him but he's moved at that their injustice in their life has pushed him to the outside the insignificant and he's like i am gonna act now of the grieving i think this is a big one i think people who are grieving especially been grieving a long time it's hard how do we bring the person back in? And it's very, very hard. But we see that Jesus has compassion on the grieving, grieving mother. 
And we see a lot of the parables about compassion, right? Where they speak of compassion, good Samaritan. Now, the story is riddled with this guy's heart, the good Samaritan, and does something about it. So the compassion of God is what moves God deeply to do something for those that are on the outside. So this next one is location. Now this might seem quite odd at its first. Bear with me. God's location, Psalm 68. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. He's up there, right? He's on the clouds. He's in glory. And look what that gets contrasted with. But he's the father to the fatherless and defender of the widows. Is God in his holy dwelling place. Like where does the glory of God and his majesty meet with the world? Well, that is for the fatherless and the defender of the widow. This is not contrast between up there and down there, but this is where you want to where you want to find God. It's where God is. God's magnificent up there, but he's down here defending the fatherless and looking after the widow. This, wow, this is amazing. God sets the lonely in families. Loneliness, that's not that wouldn't even put up there, but that's one, that's a big one for me, because that's who I want, thank the Lord he brought me and put me in a family in this church. That he championed them, and I'm glad he championed them, because if he didn't, I'd be on the outside. But I think there's something, at least the prisoners out were singing, I think there's something wonderful here about, about actually where do we want to see or where do we think we're going to find God? Where is God located? And then if we, the next slide, and look at whether Jesus is located, where would you find Jesus? What were they always <laughs> mourning about him? He's with sinner. He's with sick. He's with lepers. He's with drunkards. He's with this. He's with that. Like, where would you expect to find God? Well, not in the earliest of holies, not with the Lord. But you want to know where God is and where God's at work. It's all here. Think of, of, of the woman at the well, or the smart woman, the woman caught in adultery. The ones that we all push aside. That is where, actually, God's presence continuously is. But we see that at the same time, God is uh, Jesus set the right end of the Father. That is in all glory now. But do we think that he stopped being the God of the marginalised and the weak and the poor? Or do we still think that's where he is at work and that's where his presence is through the Holy Spirit? Where does God dwell amongst us? I think that's a really important thing. Like if we want to be in God's presence or in God's work, God's still at work, still doing this. Have I convinced you all yet? Yes. I'm sitting there saying no. Because I'll get you after. <laughs> right. I've done this either, just so you know. <laughs> Everybody thinks they have, not me. Not what I've been doing for 18 months of that. So God's instruction, what does God ask us to do? What, what does God want us to do with this? Being a part of God's kingdom, what is it that he's charged us or given us to do? Give justice to the weak and fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless and please the cause of the widow. You remember God's attributes again of love, protector, taking care and being just. We see that he asks us to participate in them. You see, looking after the marginalised, it means that we need to give justice. Justice becomes a big part of it. To rescue the weak and needy, 
is somehow a part of God's justice. But what is it that we mean by that? But another thing that I think is really helpful is that when we think of justice, we think of the justice of the Lord of the land. And what we mean by that is that there's laws in place that protect people. That's what the laws are to do. But actually, the Hebrew word for law, well, for justice, the connotations is two things. It protects legally, but it's also benevolence. So it would be something like this. To give justice means to go out and find the weak and fatherless and help them and seek them out and do what's right. Like justice in, in, in the old biblical term is a proactive thing. It's not a thing to say, well, okay, there's laws that should help homeless people, but it is actually no. True justice, think about this. That God's justice didn't stand back, did it? That he took the first move and come and seek and save us. And it's that same sort of thing. That actually God's instruction is, right, what are you going to do now? Where are you going to find the marginalised and how are you going to bring them back in? And I think we see that for in the New Testament, what's Jesus' instruction? Well, we see it in Matthew 25, and there's a big place where it says, truly I tell you, he did for the least one of these brothers and sisters you did for me who were the brothers and the sisters the poor the sick the needy those without clothes those in prison now we've also just seen there that the lord frees prisoners see god's justice or compassion reaches out to those that we think definitely don't need to those that have done crime and been locked up. They definitely, definitely don't. But actually, God's compassion is so much more bigger <clears throat> that it would be actively, what can you do to go out and do that? And he says, like, when you've done it for one of those, or to one of those, the least you've done it to me, what does that imply? God's presence or the Lord's presence again amongst these people and actually you want to meet God you meet somebody's need and there's a there's a there's a, there's a great uh, old uh, uh, old like wisdom that says that when you when you go and meet the need of an enemy and turn him into um, a friend then God's kingdom is manifested and that's wonderful so there's this proactive and as we've seen this morning Right, he says, Go with all your heart, love God. We see, so love him and love your neighbor. Like, these are not two like mutually exclusive, but actually, in loving God, you can love your neighbor. But actually, when you love your neighbor, it, that is a part of your worship of loving God. I believe that in some verses, but I think that actually, there's a real richness in that. Right, next slide. I'm nearly finished now, but this is back for you. <clears throat> this one need to think of now then, right, is what does this mean then for us as a church or as individuals or a home group or a group of people? Like, where can we be people marginalised? Well, there's a couple of things I want to think about here. One is... These are specific location. Are marginalised and not the same marginalised that might be down the road. What is it that's in Bradford that you'd see marginalised? Or our community here? Or in our church? Then the second thing is, what can we do as a church or individually? And on as I put, gifting, heart, time and capacity. Because it's not the same for everybody. And what I don't mean is to say that the... <laughs> Everybody to go out now, run out, and try to save the world. Because there's some people that have got giftings for this, but it's, it's more of, like, as a church, what can we do to what the help and support? And that'd be something that we can we can do individually and say, you know what, I want to I, I, I wanna back a ministry that does this. 
So I think, for example, um, Emily Fullerton, who um, is head of the counselling service that deals with with victims that are just unheard and invisible, it might be right. I can kind of give something to that, or I can pray into that. But my part is that I want to participate in God's work in the world, and this is just how I can do that, or what that looks like. Um, where I shared a flat with, with, with a guy, and we both got to a church that's in one of the toughest, toughest, toughest places in Aberdeen. Boy, is it poor. Like, it makes Holland look Kensington. I can say that's from Holland. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. There's, there's no, they're not an unemployment class mm. because employment it implies you can be employed. It's not that. This is generational, it's broken. And I, I'm at that church and no other church because I believe this is God's heart. It, it is for the lost. Now, I've been able to be able to do this more hands on, but I know there's a team I've got up there of um, older folk that are my prayer partners that have invested into reaching the poor through prayer and do that. There's many ways uh, that that can be done. And actually, we've seen some real blessings in that. You know, we've seen, uh, and our pastor shared it, three generations of one family get saved, being brought into a family and being really cared for. And this is generations of being excluded among the outside. Like, th this is what I think. So I think there is a place that individually or collectively that we should be proactive <laughs> in going out and caring for the oppressed. So to spend some time kind of thinking about this and thinking, well, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm bought in, I'm bought into this. And I said, I think, no, I think it's wrong. I'm not. So have a think about it and we'll kind of come back in five or ten minutes. Now, I've, I, I kind of wanted to go do that teaching and then at the end, kind of speaking to this church in, a, in that sense, that one at least a bit outside of that. But I'm very grateful that this church is a compassionate church. That's had a compassionate ministry for an extremely long time. I've beneficiaried that within the city of Rio. I think of the ministry now of... Um, the care team and caring for those that are elderly that don't get down as much for, for the varsity, for the inner city, like for for the young people. Um, and I just think we have a, we've got a wonderful heart of that and a wonderful example of that. So don't think that I'll come up here and say like you are, no, it's not that. I have to do it um, separately. But I'm very, very grateful for that. And I think that there's even more there's there's um compassion ministries that go unseen in our church in a lot of ways. I think I know there's a few people in our church that uh, foster people. What a wonderful compassion ministry that is. If we think they're all tied to some sort of injustice, there's an injustice that we have asylum seekers. There's an injustice that the somebody is homeless, injustice that somebody is father, somebody don't. But I'm very grateful that this church is a, is a church that has accepted the invitation from Christ to participate in his wonderful work of compassion. So that's where I'm going to end now. I think we will have that last song. But I'm just going to um, pray now and then we'll end over for the last song. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, we are so grateful that you are a compassionate God. Lord, if you wasn't, we'd have been still dead in our transgressions, we'd have still been sinners, we'd have been pushed on the outside. But Lord, we know what it is like to be brought in and feel the love of being brought in to the middle. Well, Lord, we thank you that you continue to have the heart for those on the outside, for the widow and the orphan. 
Lord, we, we're so grateful you care about justice. Well, Lord, we're just so blessed that you've called us into a life of a compassion ministry. And Lord, wherever that sat with us tonight, what we think about that, how we process that, Lord, I, I just really pray. And I'm just thankful for this church, Lord, continue to keep blessing it. Thank you for all the people I've served for many, many years, long before <coughs> that I've worked hard tightly to make this a, a church of, of, of compassion and a heart for the lost. I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I ask that you'll continue to bless them, that you'll keep them and you'll protect them, that you'll keep on giving them strength upon strength and grace upon grace and love upon love to continue your work. Lord, that they would minister at the place where you minister to them daily and they would know that. Lord, I'm grateful for my brothers and sisters. And we ask, Lord, that you will keep us tonight and that you'll bless your presence and your love and your kindness in our heart. In your son's name, amen. amen.